here. So why don't we uh, get into some in introductions to break the ice. Joe, since it's your first uh, debate technically on this channel, why don't, mm -hmm. we, uh, why don't we start with you? Joe, thanks for being here. Sure. Let me just uh, share a, a presentation with you if I can get that up and make sure that's all working. Um, I'm going to go for an edge tab, don't we? Window. There we go. Let's try that one there. There we go. Slideshow. Lovely stuff. Well, hopefully you can see my screen there. Um, so my name's uh, Joseph Hubbard, as you probably already know, or Indiana Joe, as I often go by. Uh, you can see our website up there. Now, I'm quite glad that I'm only defending 6,000 years of history tonight rather than the uh, 14 and a half billion years or so, or four and a half billion years, if you uh, believe that's the age of the earth that uh, Taylor's got to do tonight. But even so, there's no way that we're going to get through all of the evidence for and against evolution, creation, Noah's flood, the lot. So a reminder for our uh, viewers, first of all, you can see our website there, creationresearch.net. We actually have a QA and a Site. And the Q and A session this evening is my uh, favourite real bit of the of the whole debate in a sense because it deals with what the audience wants to talk about. But if we don't get chance to answer your question, go to creationresearch.net, click on the Q and A site, and you'll find a whole host of answers on there, including stuff from experts around the world. We're really dealing with three main debate topics this evening, um, Young Earth, Creation, Noah's Flood, and of course the debating sort of uh, uh, pivot that we're swinging on is it didn't happen. Uh, again, huge topic, not going to get through it all. Um, Interesting the way that debates work and the way that this topic works. Um, Taylor has the burden of proof in this debate. Uh, he's going to be trying to provide evidence for an alternative explanation to young earth and creation and i'll of course taking the uh the negative in a sense against the debate title so there's a uh, a bit of food for thought i've got two questions that i'm going to finish this introduction with first of all um a question for my opponent and uh this is something that we may well bring up a little bit later if the biblical account of creation and now its flood was accurate what evidence would you expect to find? And I'm going to actually flip that on its head now and ask it to myself. If the secular account of evolution and deep time, deep time is referring to uh, the millions of years versus Noah's flood uh, was accurate, what evidence would I expect to find myself? And that's kind of what my main presentation is going to hinge around. What is the evidence for? What is the evidence against? So um, there's a little introduction for me. I'll stop sharing now and escape and uh, hand back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for that uh, two minute introduction. Both of you are no strangers to this channel. So thanks again for, for being here. Uh, Snake, a, a brief uh, just introduction, who you are, what's going on at, over at your channel, if people were to check you out. Uh, yeah, go ahead. The floor is yours, Taylor. Yeah. So I, uh, the name behind my channel is Snake Was Right. And that's basically just a biblical reference to the snake in genesis and how i think that uh that um he was right and to question god and tell them that to gain knowledge i think that knowledge of good and evil is a good thing i think being aware is a good thing i don't think that uh, being kept in the dark is a good thing um and uh so following that ethos um i'm pretty much just out there to uh look at the, the facts and, and take more of an epistemological approach because uh, it really bothers me when people uh, take stances based on um, kind of what they want to take. And so I, I sometimes in taking some controversial uh, stances, uh, hard truths, if you will, um, but a lot of it centers around religious claims as well, which uh, you could argue is not so controversial anymore, but I still enjoy religious topics a lot so because um well the majority of people on the planet have some sort of religious belief so i like to shatter misconceptions i do that to myself all the time that's uh, i find it fun so that's what i like to engage in okay well thank you for the introduction taylor thanks for the introductions from the both of you uh why don't we jump right into the opening statements then uh, to be fair, we did a coin flip before we uh, got into this, so uh, we're going to hand it over to Taylor. Snake was right for his 15-minute opening statement. 
Uh, if you need to s share your screen, Taylor, let me know and I can do so for you. All right. Yeah, I don't think I'll share just yet, but uh, sure. yeah, so I lost the coin flip. Uh, I, I thought that uh, opposing the flood would be the the negative side, but um, yeah, I still think that obviously whichever whatever side is proposing something has a burden of proof i have a burden of proof to show that the earth is whatever age and if you propose a different age you have a burden of proof but uh i'll try and uh uh, uh sort of bust the myth of, uh as is the title of the debate um and then i'll I suppose I'll get to your question in the rebuttal or whatever, if the, what would I expect to find? Um, or if I have time at the end of this, I'll, I'll try to address that. So I, I just have to start to say, I'm not trying to attack uh, Christianity here, uh, just the young earth uh, interpretation. And um, of course I don't believe that Christianity is true, but this is not the point of the debate. Um, that I, th there are other reasons to believe that uh, gods are false. Um, and uh, this question is simply about the age of the earth. I think that the old age of the earth is perfectly compatible with most, if not all, religions. It's just certain myths in those religions could be interpreted as metaphors or as literally true. Um, I'm here to say that they're, they are metaphors. Um, and most of the concepts I'm going over today were pioneered not just by sincerely believing lifelong Christians, but clergy of the church. So again, none of this evidence was motivated by trying to disprove God or Christianity. None of it does disprove God or Christianity. It just disproves some of the mythical aspects of some of the stories, which um, I think have much more meaning as myths than as literal uh, accounts of history. And uh, if they're literal accounts of history, I think they become uh, exercises in just discovering how tyrannical and evil the God is. So I think that it's actually much more beneficial for the religion of Christianity to see them as myths, because then they just become about uh, humans and their relationship to the earth and the cold, hard consequences of their behaviors rather than a, an irrational god but um again i i'm trying not to attack the religion just the myth within the religion um because god can still exist even if the earth is old so and i think that that's reasonable because there are uh parts of the bible that even young earth creationists think of as myths and as metaphors so First off, um, I intend to have some discussion on the subject of Noah's Ark uh, specifically, but it's kind of a dead horse that's been beaten to death. So I'll kind of try and uh, save a lot of that more for discussion, but uh, I'll just go over my main problems with the story. So um, I think that we're left with a lot of questions because creationists have yet to provide any answers to phylogeny challenges that would need be needed to understand what the first kinds of each animal is. So it's tough to know how many animals were actually on the ark, but uh, estimates hold between like 14,000, 17,000 animal species could be held on it. Um, uh, th but this would still require uh, unrealistically fast evolution post flood, um, which would be like on the low end, a new species every 30 years, which is simply not observed uh, evolving. Um, and uh, this account of events would also require miracle after miracle to sustain the whole thing. And none of it could just continue naturally. It, it would not be self-sustaining with natural means. Um, so the idea that miracles are constantly infused into this whole chain of events uh, just makes it less and less and less likely. Um, and it's kind of absurd because God could have just snapped his fingers and come up with an, an immediate solution to get from point a to point b that wouldn't require the whole flood uh, it wouldn't require killing all the children all the animals um 
or sustaining a, a, st- a year-long storm that supposedly reformed the Earth. Um, other problems with the Ark story is uh, that it wouldn't be seaworthy at all. Um, we've actually tested wooden boats um, that were s- even smaller than the Ark. Um, and th- there was a famous ship called the Wyoming. It was made of uh, wood, and which the Ark would have been, and but it was made with modern technology um, and a whole crew of people, not just eight people uh, or wh- how- however many. The maximum would be eight people who built the Ark. Um, and they were not known to be uh, boat builders. Um, and they had, did not have modern technology. They would have had ancient technology. So the Wyoming, which was built by professionals with modern technology and was smaller than the Ark, was so too large for the wooden materials. So it would bend in all directions and it w- leaked constantly and it eventually sank because of this. Um, and again, it was not a, even as large as the Ark, which would have even more bending problems. Um, and, uh, so you'd need to invoke a miracle to explain why the Ark didn't sink. It could possibly be magically enchanted by God, but, um, again, the more miracles you invoke, the more, uh, ridiculous the story becomes, especially if you're going to invoke miracles at all, God could have just solved it in one miracle. So actually the more miracles you do, if you even if you accept miracles, the less miracles is still the better. Um, so, yeah, I mean, an, one solution to this would have just poof Noah and his family onto dry land or a new earth. There's no reason that it needs to stay the same earth, unless again, it's a metaphorical story about our earth and the damage that we can do to it. Um, I'm not necess- I'm not really necessarily talking about uh, global warming, um, just in case <laughs> there's any perception of dog whistling going on there. Um, just our responsibility to our environment. Um, so the metaphorical interpretation is the only good interpretation again. And um, I'd also like to point out that uh, the Titanic, which was much larger than Noah's Ark, only carried a little bit over a thousand people. Um, and for a I've a couple week trip, how, however long the trip was, it wasn't very long. It wasn't a, a year. Um, so Noah's Ark needs to not only account for however many animals were on board, which uh, would be a ridiculously large amount. Um, and as soon as you lower the amount, that makes the amount of species that need to evolve per year in the 4,000 years after the Ark uh, much more ridiculous. Um, it's ridiculous even at the smallest rate. Um, not observable. Um, but you also have to account for the food stored on it for a year. You have to account for the labor it would take to um, take care of all those animals. You'd have to account for the structural instability of such a vessel, which has already been proven to not work. Um, and so the, already just with a single boat, uh, it just requires miracle after miracle. And, uh, that's not scientific or defensible at all. Um, but the, every single field of science disproves the flood model. Um, as I mentioned before, it was actually creationists, Christian creationist clergy who were involved in uh, geology who first proposed that the flood model was in fact uh, just metaphorical and not true. So they didn't have, and this was all before Darwin, so they didn't have any motivation to disprove Christianity. They were just going off of the geological science. And so what the geology told us was that there was deep time involved because it takes a lot longer than a year for um, for rocks to lithify, which is uh, solidify from um, sedimentation. Um, and there, the uh, they discovered there were nonconformities, which would require uh, a lot of time to bring up solidified rock and move it into um, higher strata. Um, but it's not just geology that precludes it. Um, 
And so the best chemistry, the best geology, the best physics available of our time all uniformly show that the Earth is billions of years old, um, including those done by Christians, even including those experiments done by creationists. Uh, I'll show this. Um, the only people on Earth who actually question these results are people who have stated that the evidence doesn't matter if it conflicts with the biblical account. And I understand there are some creationists who won't go that far. Uh, but if if you stand by these sorts of statements of faith that the Bible always comes first, no matter what the evidence say, this is essentially scientific fraud. And anyone who makes these statements has lost all credibility. So that's why a lot of the so-called creation research is not even uh, looked at. Uh, and so, like I said, uh, cre even creationist data has shown that the uh, mainstream sciences are reliable. Um, Andrew Snelling, who is a creationist, uh, has done experiments and published four uh, answers in Genesis, uh, has said that uh, there is no doubt that there, after decades of numerous careful, four Sorry, minutes. I'm getting I'm getting feedback. Okay, um, radioisotope dating investigations um, has been well established. So the dating methods, uh, radioactive dating methods, are extremely reliable, and they all corroborate each other. And there's basically no um, no way to contend with the evidence of radioactive decay um, they uh, there are ways to eliminate samples that have been contaminated we know what that looks like there are we've thrown everything we can at the at atoms to see how if we can accelerate their decay um, obviously uh, there are things called nuclear reactions which um, accelerates the uh, the fission of atoms, um, but that's not the same as decay. Decay just uh, occurs naturally without you bombarding them with particles like electrons or um, or uh, splitting the atoms. Um, so that's there's a difference there, which is uh, decay and a nuclear reaction. Um, and we found no way to accelerate natural decay at all. Um, and there have been some experiments with bombarding things with electrons, which again is just a nuclear reaction, but uh, have accelerated the apparent decay by, by a little bit. But none of these are actually, um, th this wouldn't speed it up any more than 1.5%. And again, it's not natural decay. And this is for a uh, Beryllium-7, I believe, which is not geologically relevant to any of the dating methods. Um, and assuming all of that state-of-the-art science is false, um, even those confirmed by creationists, we would have a significant heat problem, unless you are proposing that nuclear decay does not produce heat anymore, um, which, of course, again, requires even more miracles. Um, so I'm not sure why anyone's bothering to defend a naturalistic mechanism for the flood. You could just say it was all done by magic, um, and it would actually make a lot more sense because you need magic every step of the way anyway. Um, so again, uh, assuming that we don't know radioactive decay constants, and we aren't able to tell initial conditions of the rocks, which we can test today, um, you would have a massive heat problem. Um, it's and it can't be blocked by water or rock because that's it's not the radioactivity that's being blocked. It is the heat produced by the radioactivity that would evaporate all the planet, uh, all the oceans. Um, the uh, massively huge. Uh, one minute, Taylor. One minute. Okay, I'll try to wrap up real quick. Uh, the the huge amount of heat produced by rapidly moving tectonic plates would boil off the oceans twenty two times. Uh, that would be twenty two times the heat needed to boil off the oceans if they were three times larger than they are now. That's in addition to the heat problem created by radioactivity, uh, the limestone accumulation rates that we observe 
are not uh, compatible with a young Earth time scale. Um, the uh, let's see. Uh, uh, again, with rates, uh, coral deposition rates, coral growth rates, I mean, um, also similar to limestone, not compatible with young earth time scales. Uh, and seconds. I suppose I'll, I can uh, end off there. Awesome. Just on time. And I'm going to take you off full screen. Thanks to the chat. The chat having a great time already we've got about 50 people in the chat and the super stickers are flying in guys thanks so much for the the support i'm and just seeing the chat go. explode here it's quite it's quite great the amount of comments. <laughs> it's, it's, great fun. it's very it's hard to keep up with so that's why please yeah, guys yeah, yeah. tag me with your questions or i will probably miss it so i'm also <laughs> trying to look at the time so uh that being said joe we're going to hand it over to you for your 15 minute opening statement thank you and whenever just, you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just try and get my uh, presentation back up again. Uh, doo -doo. Bear with me. Window. Um, it's this one, isn't it? Yep. All right. All right. Can you just let me know that that's uh, being seen? Looks good. Looks good, Joe. Great. All right. Are we ready then? All good to go, yeah? We are ready. Uh, on your first word, Joe, I'll start your timer on your first word. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for uh, doing this and uh, for standing for truth for hosting this. Reminder of our question um, that I'm going to be asking myself tonight, if the secular account of evolution and deep time was accurate, what evidence would I expect to find? Um, let's start by what is evolution. Uh, here's one definition of what evolution is. What we're talking about when it comes to evolution is the change of existing life forms. Um, Taylor Gray, March 2019, in a debate with Kent Hovid. Now, I watched the both the debates that um, Taylor has done with uh, Kent Hovid. They're very fascinating, and I would encourage people to go and watch them, um, because what's interesting is this is sort of the structure of the argument uh, that Taylor puts forward that there, we observe change today, so therefore we can call observable change evolution, and then there comes an assumption, an assumption that given enough time, small changes can develop into big changes, and so we call evolution science. What's interesting is that Taylor actually makes the same mistake that Darwin did. Oh, Charles Darwin? On the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. <gasps> They loved long titles in those days. Although what's interesting is if you can see down there, he's actually a fellow of the Linnaean Society. Linnaeus, as in Carl Linnaeus, who invented our modern classification system, who actually lifted names directly out of the Bible. Because in the Bible, it says that God created things after their kind or to reproduce after their kind. And the word for kind in the Latin Bible, and it's the same in the Greek as well, is genus. And Carl Linnaeus lifted it directly out of there and said, God created things after their genus, so I'm going to name my main grouping of animals genus, and then they can diversify into species or special creatures, which is where the word species actually comes from. You see, Charles Darwin, having graduated in theology, knew exactly what he was actually doing when he wrote The Origin of Species. And I'll be blunt, I'd have been a lot more impressed by his work if he'd have written a book called The Origin of Genus. But let's move on. What evidence is there for evolution? Where would you go to look for it? Well, we can have a look at a 5,000-year-old experiment that mankind has been participating in uh, for the last 5,000 years or so, agriculture. Uh, plants, animals, breeding them specifically, helping to change them. Let's use one example the brassica kind. Uh, standard in agriculture, um, an original brassica genus or an original brassica plant which diversified or evolved, however you want to define it, into all of the different brassica kinds and sort of breeds that we see today. You've got brassica napus, which is the rapeseed or canola, as you call it in the, in the States, brassica rapa, which is the pak choy, and my personal favorite, brassica olacera. Now, I have been driving down to the Isle of Wight from where I live today, and the roadsides are literally littered with hundreds of Brassica olicera, or the wild cabbage. 
And what's interesting is the wild cabbage not only produces the modern cabbage varieties that you actually see in your supermarket, it produces a seed head, which if you breed to get larger, you end up with broccoli. If you breed it even bigger, you get calabries. And if you mutate it to go with no pigment, it turns into cauliflower. You can create collard greens or Napoleon can march his armies through and chop all the heads off cabbages so that they uh, sprout out little cabbages out of the sides and you produce sprouts. You can breed them to produce ornamental cabbages, marrow cabbage, kale, uh, kohlrabi. But scientifically, even though we have this incredible variety in a single species, they are still a single species, Brassica olacera, a huge amount of variety, yet clearly not enough for them to be defined as different species. The point they're all still cabbages. Can you have change without evolution? Of course you can. Of course you really need to actually get down to defining what evolution is. So first off, what do we actually observe? We observe diversification within kinds, all as a result of a loss of information, which is not evolution. You see, Brassica olacera started with all of the inherent information that it needed to produce all these different breeds of cabbages, yet each specific breed of uh, cabbage, whether it be broccoli or kohlrabi, has all resulted as a loss of information from the original wild cabbage. It has not gained anything. It's not evolution. What is science? Well, according to the National Academy of Science, which is a very prestigious American association, everything must be observable, measurable, and discoverable, and then be able to be successfully and repeatedly tested. That's what science is according to the National Academy of Science. So let's have a look at the supposed evolution of dogs. According to secular evolution, a single-celled creature managed to all by itself evolve into a fish, which managed to all by itself evolve into an amphibian, into a reptile, into a reptile-like mammal, into a mammal, and then into a wild dog. That wild dog then diversified into the various breeds of wild and domestic dogs that we actually see today. Now, you can actually see on the screen you've got two different types of change here. One on the right-hand side, one on the left-hand side. One has been observed, one has not. The right-hand side one has been observed. We see it every day. We can breed dogs. But the assumption is that given the small changes we can see in dogs happening today, given enough time, a fish can turn into a dog and beyond. Of course, you take the biblical picture. In the beginning, God created the dog kind to reproduce after its own kind. And that's exactly what we see today. You have a dog uh, diversifying into other dogs. But there is a strong limit as to how far this can actually go. Of course, if you want to look up the definition or the origin of the word evolution, it was a military term as in we're going to uh, the captain says we're going to evolve around the enemy camp and get them from behind. It references to a spiral, to a circular. In fact, this is a standard representation in many textbooks of the circular climb of life. You do realize if you want to start with a single cell creature down at the volcano there and all by itself evolve its way up to all the diversity we see today, you need to add an incredible amount of information. And that's something that we've never actually observed. So what do we observe? No evolution occurring today, no evolution in the last 4,000 years of agricultural breeding, no evolution over hundreds of thousands of observed generations, and you can go down to the tiny little fruit fly which reproduce extremely quickly, Ah, no evolution there. I'm not the only one to say this, by the way. Have a look at what Richard Dawkins says. Famous atheist, famous anti-creationist. He says this, evolution has been observed, it's just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. Do you know what he's just told you there? It hasn't been observed. Hmm. Interesting what uh, these proponents of evolution can come out with sometimes. Biology? Yep. From the evidence we can see from biology, young earth creation and Noah's flood, it did happen. All right, if you want the ultimate evidence for evolution, because just proving whether something does or doesn't evolve today doesn't mean that's how it's always happened. If you want the ultimate evidence for evolution, you need to go to the fossil record, which is a record of past life. No doubt about it. What do you find? Living fossils. The Nautilus, uh, the fossil Nautilus there on the left, the modern counterpart on the right, no change whatsoever. And you can find these in abundance all the way up and down through the layers. In fact, Charles Darwin coined the term living fossil. He said these are anomalous forms. These are anomalies, which can be called living fossils. They've endured today and they help us in forming a picture of ancient life. 
course, Darwin himself contradicted himself many times, but in this place in particular, first of all, he starts off by saying that living fossils are um, there, they're supposed to be anomalies, yet they appear to be all over the place. But then he goes to say his entire theory is based on not the strongest species that survives or the most intelligent, it's the one that's most adaptable to change. His theory is dependent on creatures being able to change, and yet the fossil record really does not show that. If there is change in the fossil record, it is always a degeneration, and let me show you what I mean. This is a ginkgo leaf from the Jurassic uh, rocks in Yorkshire, not too far away from where we are now. Um, there's another one there. Can you see all the lovely fronds, the multi-leaf patterns? Well, there's the modern counterpart. They're regarded as living fossils, even by secular standards. They are so identical uh, to the tree, there's no doubt about it that this is the modern living counterpart. But do you notice how it's not got those spread of fingers anymore? Ah, it has changed. But the reality is, it's been a reduction and loss. It has lost the ability to have those fronds. It hasn't evolved. It's devolved. It's going the wrong way. Change? Absolutely. Evolution? No. It's not gained any new information. It's lost. Professor Gold, Stephen Gold, famous paleontologist, uh, evolutionist, all paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. Even the National Geographic were forced to admit, illuminating but spotty, the fossil record is like a film of evolution from which 999 out of every 1,000 frames has been lost. I wonder how you'd actually build a picture of evolution if that was true. Evidence from fossils? Now, creatures, according to the fossil record, creatures have either remained the same, there's been no change, they either have changed, but it's always been a devolution and a loss of information, or they have gone extinct. Not one of those is any help to evolution in the slightest, but exactly what we would expect if the Bible was actually true. Fossils, young earth creation, Noah's flood, the evidence says it did happen. All right, well, uh, we've only got a few minutes left in this presentation um, as we delve into Noah's Flood, and it was a year-long event, so there's no way we're going to cover it all. Remember the website I mentioned at the beginning, creationresearch.net, but we've got three main principle points to deal with. Principle number one, not time but process. Okay, case in point, a fossil fish. This is on display in the Genesis Museum of Creation Research, one of our big displays in the UK. Can you see big fish? Can you see little fish? Can you see little fish coming out of big fish's mouth? Ah, you see, one thing that you absolutely know about fossils when you see them like this is that this was buried very rapidly indeed. You see, if you want to get a fossil, you have to bury it and preserve it quicker than it takes for that animal to actually decay. Especially if you want to preserve the scales, the fins, the absolute beautiful detail Rocks with fossils in them are fast rocks. They have to be, otherwise they'd simply not actually get any fossils in them in the slightest. I mean, uh, Taylor brought up about limestone, and we might deal with that in the rebuttal, um, but one thing we know for sure, if you look at modern limestone deposits, they have no macro fossils or large fossils in them in the slightest. Yet yeah, come with me to Hunt Stanton, which was the subject of my thesis, and it is packed full of fossils, all pointing the same way, all swept into position. Something is going wrong here. Principle number two, large-scale rapid deposition. I mean, Tyler mentioned uh, uh, rates of deposition and stuff like that. Again, we haven't got time to go into detail, but hopefully this will give you a bit of a picture. Um, this is a photo of me just a few weeks ago, and you can see me standing next to that large sort of cone-shaped structure there, um, or circular structure. It's actually a fossil tree. This is in the Carboniferous rocks in Northumberland. Carboniferous, by the way, refers to the fact that there's plenty of coal in there. It corresponds exactly with Pennsylvanian or Mississippian over in the States, because, of course, us Brits named Carboniferous, and the Americans couldn't possibly go with our name, so they named it Mississippian and Pennsylvanian uh, after the two um, states there in, America, in the USA. What is it? It's a polystrate tree, a term coined by Professor Derek Ager, a world expert in this field. Poly means many. Straight refers to the strata or the layers. This is a fossil tree which protrudes up through many layers, all in situ. 
Now, if you want to actually fossilize this tree in the position that it's there, you have to bury it very, very quickly indeed. Otherwise, it would just simply rot. It would simply be destroyed. If you really go by the rate of deposition, you're looking at about give or take one to two thousand years per inch of sedimentation if the dates are accurate. There's no way that you'd ever bury a massive great big tree. Of course, the UK isn't the only place we've found these polystrate trees. You can see so much detail in them. Two minutes. Thank you very much. You can see so much detail in them that you can actually tell what kind of tree they are. Here's one, Carboniferous Nova Scotia. Here's one, same tree type, it's a lycopod tree, same layers, coal seam at the base, no branches or roots. This is in Carboniferous Tennessee. Here's one in Carboniferous Manchester in the UK. Here's one in the Carboniferous Permian beds in Newcastle in Australia. You see, polystrate trees did not live there. They did not die there. They've been stripped of their roots and branches. They often have rounded or braided ends, which comes from sweeping down with many water. They have no fossil substance at the base, so they certainly didn't grow there. They were washed into position along with the sediment and buried quickly. Ah, principle number three, and this is what we're finishing on, worldwide deposits. Carboniferous polystrate trees all around the world, full of fossils that were buried very quickly. What's the size of the carboniferous beds? According to Professor Derek Age of the World Expert, the Carboniferous extends in essentially the same form from Texas to the Dantes Coal Basin in the north of the Caspian Sea. There's Texas, there's the Caspian Sea. This amounts to some 170 degrees of longitude and closing up the Atlantic by a mere 40 percent does not really, or 40 degrees, does not really help at all that much in explaining this remarkable phenomenon. There's the flood deposits. And even more remarkable, we've now found them down in Australia. That is a big flood that buried it very, very quickly indeed. Um, the fact of the matter is flood deposits are worldwide. And this is without talking about drowned dinosaurs, Jurassic log jams, uh, worldwide Cretaceous deposits, worldwide flood deposits, and so on and so forth. We just cannot simply cover them tonight. Geology, young earth creation and Noah's flood. Yeah, absolutely it happened. The evidence clearly points in favour. A reminder to Taylor and to all of our audience here this evening, there are many ideas, theories and opinions that contradict every single part of the Bible, but the facts never actually do. Thank you very much. Okay, just on time, guys. Uh, thanks to the both of you. That concludes our opening statements for the evening. We are now moving into the eight-minute rebuttal rounds. We're going to be handing it over to Snake. What I can do is at the seven minute mark, I'll give you guys a one minute uh, warning just so you guys can start uh, kind of wrapping up your points, wrapping up your thoughts. We got a lot of questions coming in. So thank you so much guys for tagging me and looks like we're gonna have a good audience Q&A. So let's hand it over to Taylor. Taylor, the floor is yours on your first word. You've got eight minutes. All right, so um, I guess I'll start with the, what you said was a, a definition I gave for evolution. Um, I would, that's not the definition of evolution, but it is uh, what we observe. Uh, there is a change in existing life forms, um, but it's more about populations. So um, then you said uh, the entire evolution argument is just that we observe change, then we call that evolution, and then we assume that enough of time, small changes can develop into big changes, and then we call that science. So that's an extremely truncated uh, lacking <laughs> uh, process of how we went about proving evolution. So it's not an assumption. Um, it's actually um, that small changes can develop into big changes. It's just accumulation. So that's the equivalent of saying that if traveling 10 feet is possible, it's not possible to travel a mile. Or because it rains, there's no such thing as a puddle. Um, so if you accumulate small changes, they will become big changes over time. That's just a fact. There's no way to avoid that. Uh, the only way to avoid that is to say that there just wasn't enough time. Um, and that's not what we call evolution science. Um, evolution was, uh, turned into a science because it made testable predictions about what would be in the fossil layer. So that goes back to what would we expect if, uh, um, if the secular, actually scientific view of things was true, um, we would expect to see things like um, transitional forms in the fossils, and we would expect to know where to find them as well, because all of the uh, animals actually fit into a uh, 
an evolutionary pattern, and they don't fit into any kind of flood pattern, like things that were able to escape floodwaters. No, entire ecologies are buried per layer, and they don't overlap. Um, and there's uh, transitional forms between them, and it always transitions in the same way towards modern forms. And the forms of those things can be predicted by evolution, like the Archaeopteryx, which is literally just a dinosaur with feathers. Um, and uh, this was all predicted using evolution, and not, and none of this was able to be predicted by biblical creation. They have absolutely nothing to say about this. So what would we expect if uh, the biblical creation was accurate? What evidence would we expect to find is we would expect to see uniform mix of creatures within each flood layer. We would expect only to see uh, a couple of flood layers. We wouldn't expect any of the radiometric dating to, uh, results to corroborate with each other. Um, we wouldn't, and uh, we wouldn't be able to predict transitional forms. Um, and, uh, we would also expect to find a waterless scorched earth that has been uh, absolutely heated to death because nothing that happens in the biblical creation account is even physically possible. Um, so we would not even exist to find anything, first of all. Um, let's see. Uh, in your slide that you showed dogs and uh, a fish going to an amphibian, to a reptile, to a mammal, and wild dogs, you said... The one on the left is observed and the one on the right is not, but that's not true either. We have observed every single change that occurs uh, between fish and amphibians and reptiles and mammals. Um, we've just observed them individually, not in, in a row. So every single change that is possible from scales to hairs, scales to feathers, um, changing of uh, the, the body plan. We've observed that. We've observed animals that gain new bones. We've observed animals that change the shape of their bones, orientation, location of their bones. We've seen uh, new organs uh, and um, the, the ability for fish to live on land. That's all variable within kind. We've seen them change... Um, their habits about living on land. We've seen fish that can breathe oxygen as well. And those, of course, are also developed from organs use, uh, that are exist in fish that can't breathe uh, on land. Um, and all the changes required for that to occur have also been observed to occur in real time today. Um, that's literally just changing the, uh, ox the, uh, uh, blood vessel um, density in one of their float bladders. That's been observed to be possible today. So ev so when we actually break it down, what's actually occurring at each step, every single step has been observed today. And um, yeah, it makes sense that a four-legged reptile with a tail that has scales, and we know scales tur can turn into hairs, uh, there's no reason why that reptile cannot evolve into a mammal. There's absolutely no reason that can't happen. And we see that the fossil record is, in fact, literally a low frame rate video of life's history. So we have observed all of evolution. Not quite all of it. There are some gaps, but uh, that's why I said low frame rate, because we get snapshots here and there. But it is literally, and I mean literally, a video of life's history. Instead of re being recorded on film, it's just recorded in rocks. And again, that it only fits the evolutionary pattern. And there's also this uh, claim re repeated that um, some of the more archaic animals are exactly the same. Uh, I could show a couple of slides if I have time. Um, but uh, there's. You've got a minute and 50 seconds, Taylor, if you wanted to show a slide. I could can we pause, pause it, it for. Yeah. yeah, let's set that up. So I've got it paused in exactly one minute and 41 seconds, and we can share your screen. Okay.
I don't see it popping up yet. There Got we go. It. Okay. All right. So we're this is a uh, this is showing uh, coelacanths, and um, it's often claimed that they are unchanging through the fossil record, but that's just absolutely not true. But we can see through comparative anatomy, which creationists, of course, accept up until some arbitrary point where they decide they don't like it anymore, that uh, they use comparative anatomy to show that things are the same kind until they until we get to uh, transitional forms. Um, and then they say it's not true anymore, which actually I have another slide somewhere, but it's it's in a different project. Um, Barominology actually, they, we've eventually gotten so many specimens that they showed that dinosaurs are in fact the same kind as birds because the uh, the gaps between each species became smaller than the gaps required for barominology to uh, say that they were different kinds. Um, and as you can also see, within the same coelacanth species, which creationists would uh, accept are uh, the same species uh, kind, they have completely different forms of fins. And we see that today, the same species of fish can have completely different fin skeletons. Uh, he mentioned brassica. Um, and if evolution seconds. is always a loss, how did this come to this perfect fractal series in brassica? Um, that's obviously not a loss in information. That's obviously a gain in very complex information. This doesn't just happen um, because uh, it, it's degrading. Um, and then I wanted to address uh, that uh, fossils that are buried uh, rapidly have to be during the Noahic flood. Well, floods do happen, and uh, they, they're yeah, local sometimes. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I can finish that, but yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Taylor. That's your eight minute rebuttal. I know these rebuttals really do fly by. Um, so we're gonna hand it over to Joseph Hubbard. Once again, I wanna thank the chat though for all the super stickers, super chats flying in. Tons of good questions. So we're gonna turn this debate into a 10 hour debate. I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> we won't be I don't think either of us will be able to survive. No, I don't think any of us could handle that. <laughs> uh, so that being said. It was just turned into a, a strength a endurance test rather than yes. <laughs> <laughs> A debate on endurance, who can last Indeed. the longest. So uh, we'll hand it over to you, Joe. Uh, whenever you're ready, Thank you've you. got eight minutes. I may want to um, share some slides halfway through. So if we can pause like we did for for, for Taylor, that'd be really great as well. Okay, Absolutely. let's go. Um, there was a, a lot of different things mentioned in uh, in Taylor's first uh, presentation. So we're not going to cover them all. Interesting, I found interesting is there was... Um, quite a lot of moral issues that he had with the flood things like what's you know why what's the point in killing uh, humans and children and so on and so forth um i'm assuming that uh, taylor is coming from an atheistic background so it's interesting that there's a moral issue for him because of course from an atheistic background there can be no such things as morals unless there is a moral standard for which you can adhere to um so it's interesting a few other points as well things about uh, noah's boat we could spend uh, hours on this uh, conversation and uh, um, Taylor produced examples. I could produce other examples of wooden sailing ships, which were in ancient from the Greek and the Chinese, which were nearly as uh, as big as uh, Noah's Ark. You can talk about the biblical dimensions uh, of Noah's Ark being the most stable excuse me, uh, being the most stable out of any dimensions that you can use. And you can actually match this up with the modern dimensions that we're using today as well. Again, if you go to creationresearch.net, you can see a lot more details on there. We just don't have time to deal with them all tonight. Um, interesting, uh, Taylor also mentioned at some point, whether it was in the rebuttal or in the, uh, in the presentation about Archaeopteryx being uh, literally a feathered dinosaur. I'm afraid one person who'd have to disagree with you is Professor Angela Minter, or Milner sorry, um, from the Natural History Museum in the UK. Uh, very prestigious museum, very prestigious institute. She's done loads of research on the original Archaeopteryx that was owned by um, the founder of the Natural History Museum himself and uh it is under no doubt about it it is a bird and she by the way is no friend of uh, creation either what they've actually been able to do is go into the skull of the brain the skull of uh, archaeopteryx itself pull out a model of the brain match it compared to a 
Reptiles' brain are magic compared to a bird's brain, and they are vastly different. There's no doubt about it. Archaeopteryx is a bird. Yes, it's an unusual bird. It has claws in it, on its wings, and it has teeth. But then there are multiple birds alive today that have claws on their wings, and there are birds that do have teeth as well. In fact, every single bird is born with at least one tooth uh, when it hatches out of its egg. So that's not really an evidence for or against evolution. Uh, I'm just going to share some slides now and deal with a couple of things, if I can just get those up. Yes, and I've got your timer paused at five minutes and 37 seconds. Thank you very much. I think it's this one. Let's just get that up and get it up on the right one. You're good. Okay, let's, uh, we're good. Yep, thank you. Um, let's deal with radiometric dating because that came up and there's many different examples that we could talk about again, a uh, chance to deal with all of them. Let's talk about something like uranium to lead or obidian to um, uh, strontium. Uh, if we assume that the decay rates have been consistent through time, the Earth is at least 4.6 billion years old. Let me just put that there uh, as a start. And what's interesting to tie it in, um, Taylor also mentioned here uh, the Christian clergy that suggested that the uh, Earth was very old and Noah's flood was just a, a myth or an, an allegory or so on and so forth, which was before Darwin. You need to get the full picture because deep time goes way further back than that. It was the Assyrians and Babylonians that first sort of began to structure it, was passed on to the Greeks and passed on down through the ages. What's interesting is a lot of the pre-Darwinian geologists, the sort of the founding fathers of if geology if you want people like adam sedgwick people like uh william buckland or george buckland and um william fox all of them started out uh, as what you might call Bible believers. They believed in a Noah's flood. Uh, they believed that that produced the vast amount of the fossil bearing sediments around the world. And you are right, in later in their life, they began to actually write against that. They began to bring up some different ideas. But there was a major tipping point where I actually got them to that. And that was a man by the name of Charles Lyell, who was a Scottish lawyer. And I have a whole presentation on him. We don't have time to go into that. But what's interesting is if you read through Lyell, uh, works, he's very clever and he knows what he's doing when it comes to being a lawyer because he actually says not only is the present the key to the past, but my main aim in promoting this uniformitarian philosophy is to free the signs from Moses. He was specifically anti-biblical. It had nothing to do with evidence in the slightest. Now, the most of geologists today have disregarded Lyell's major uniformitarian ideas, but the reality is that philosophy is actually underpinning in almost every single major geological process that we use to show that the Earth is millions of years old. And so, no doubt about it, if we assume the decay rates have been consistent through time, the Earth is at least four and a half billion years old. Here's the problem. You actually need to cross-check these dates. Um, uranium decay releases helium into the atmosphere. That's an observable thing. We see it all the time. Therefore, the age of the rocks derived from something like uranium lead decay must be proportional to the amount of helium in the atmosphere. Because what's really great about helium is that almost none escapes out of our atmosphere. Um, we've done plenty of tests. Radioactive decay from uh, uranium to lead, uh, of uranium and thorium, which are both key things in these dating tests, releases uh, helium into the atmosphere, hardly ever escapes. Let's look at the figures. The rate of observed helium loss from the atmosphere, which is almost zero, if you also assume that that has been constant, which, by the way, you're assuming that the rate of decay has always been constant and that there's been no other alternative effects to it. So we can, by the same logic that you're using to date the Earth being very old, can assume that helium loss from the atmosphere has also been constant. All of the helium in the atmosphere could have accumulated in just two million years. Now, obviously, this is vastly older than the 6,000 years that I'm promoting, but it's ridiculously smaller than the four and a half billion years that Taylor's promoting. The reality is something is not right here. The reality is something has happened in Earth's climate, in Earth's atmosphere, in Earth's groundworks, which has affected the way that rate of decay happens, because we simply don't see it in the real world.
Fossils and Evolution, Oxford University Press, very prestigious publication. Dr. Kemp is the curator of zoological collections at Oxford University. He says this, to account for evolutionary changes that take millions of years to complete or to completion solely by reference to processes that can be studied only over tens of years requires an extraordinary fact. A reminder to everybody tonight, this debate is not the fact of evolution versus the Christian faith. This is a fact-based Christian faith versus the extraordinary evolutionist faith. Um, that's really what we're dealing with here. Uh, standing for truth, how long have I got? You've got a minute and 15 seconds. A minute and 15 seconds. Thank you very, very much. Let's deal with... Uh, one last thing then, I'm just quickly looking over my notes here. Um, let's deal with uh, rates very, very briefly again then. Um, we mentioned, I mentioned it briefly earlier, you're dealing with limestone. Taylor mentioned observable limestone rates. We can go and see calcareous ooze forming today. It's formed of little tiny microscopic uh, minerals that are building up from the shells not a single major fossil in them. Yet you go to the major Cretaceous deposits, which by the way, go all over the world and they're absolutely crammed full of them. Now, Taylor ended his uh, critique by saying, well, you have a local flood that happens. But my point for my first presentation is this is no local flood. This is the same bed of sediments with the same fossils in it, which were all buried very quickly, which goes around most of the world. Um, and even stuff that professors of geology are saying, we can't explain this remarkable phenomena. Uh, you go to the Cretaceous deposits, they travel all over the world. The Jurassic deposits, same deposits, same fossils, directional flow. I mean, the Chattanooga Shale, which I've personally gone and dug up in Tennessee, covers over most of the United States of America, and they're all pointing in the same direction. That's no local flood. That's a very massive worldwide flood. Okay, just on time. Gentlemen, thanks so much. That concludes our opening statements and our rebuttals. We are now moving into the cross-examination portion of the debate. Snake started off with his opening statement. Therefore, uh, we're going to hand it over to Snake. You have eight minutes to cross-examine Joe. And I will uh, start the timer whenever you guys are ready to go. Uh, the floor is yours, gentlemen. All right. Um, so you said, uh, or you didn't say, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a background in uh, zoo and working at a zoo. I worked at a zoo for six years. Yes. And I ended up doing qualifications in uh, zoology as well in Sparshall University. All right. So how many animals could you take care of in like a single day and how much room do they need? Well, what we have today is uh, a system by which we have to follow a series of laws in the UK. It's a bit different to the USA, um, but we were dealing with, on average, uh, on several, several, a few, a couple of hundred animals on a, on a relatively small team, going by the uh, the statement in the law that we have to follow. Um. So would you? So uh, would the law deem? the care that would have to occur on the ark as uh, illegal or abusive? Well, it depends. The, at that moment, you're moving into the realm of animal rights, which is a completely different scenario, um, which, we're, which we're dealing with. But you could very easily keep animals in a much lesser condition because you've got to remember at the end of the day, when we're dealing with Noah's flood, we're not talking about zoo exhibits on display. We're talking about a survival method uh, for all of life. If you take the Bible as account as literal as I do. So you're dealing with a survival method. You're also not dealing with used examples like Titanic and the like um, in terms of the ark stability. Noah wasn't building a moving vessel. He was building a barge, essentially a lifeboat. So you're instantly dealing with a different ballpark uh, rather than trying to compare it to something where we have to give this donkey at least two acres of space. Otherwise, it's deemed to be uh, irresponsible for that donkey to be kept alive in that state. Um, you're dealing with com two completely different issues. So how many do you think you could take care of per day? Myself? On, on myself? Yeah, just one person. Under which conditions? Under a zoo conditions or under an art conditions? Art conditions. Okay. Well, first of all, we have a remarkable thing, which a lot of animals can do, which is hibernate. Uh, and a huge amount of animals can be going to forced hibernation as well, far more than what may do naturally in the wild. So first of all, you've instantly cut down a huge amount of your work there by uh, 
animals in hibernation and so on and so forth. Um, secondly, you painted a picture earlier on as well of a sort of a primitive ancient technology. Well, we don't have time to get into ancient technology and the like of that. Um, but one thing that we do know for sure is that if you look at human skeletons going back through time, they're physiques as well as their brains were a lot bigger than ours. Now, there really is nothing to suggest in any evidence that humans were more primitive or more stupid in the past than we are today. So if today we can make up and figure up designs and ways of feeding animals commercially, which by the way, we can because we do it in commercial farming, which is probably a lot closer uh, conditions to what we're talking about in the ark than what we're talking about in a zoo uh, commercially we can have stuff which multi-feeds multi-cleans so on and so forth i see no reason why we can't do that in an arc scenario as well uh, and there was a wonderful study done by um John Woodmore P, which you can find out more details online. Yes, a lot of it is theoretical uh, when you're talking about designs, but it's using known technological designs from the past and in putting them into an arc scenario. Um. Uh, so how would the animals know to hibernate since there wouldn't be any environmental cues that they usually use to hibernate? Yeah, but then there, there's also no uh, reason why they would travel to the ark in the first place. You see, what you have to get your head around is not just the fact that this is a natural phenomenon, because it was a natural phenomenon, it was a worldwide flood, but also there was a spiritual aspect to it as well. Whatever caused the flood, if it was a natural explanation or not, ultimately it goes back to God. Now, I know you reject the idea of a God specifically, um, but at the end of the day, the Bible is a spiritual book. Now, we're not talking about magic and stuff like that here, because that's a completely different, separate thing. We're talking about a God who actually intervenes and a God who has a right to judge. And the Bible's oh. explicitly clear that the flood was God's judgment on mankind. And the Bible's also explicitly clear that God sent the animals that he chose to Noah. So really, you've got to be dealing with the spiritual aspect of this flood as well. So how is a miracle different from magic? Okay, well, you need to go back into the history of words when you're dealing with magic or magi. That's where we get the wise men at Christmas from. Uh, it's also where we get the word machine from. It's all connected into a physical work, which is, in a sense, unexplainable. So when you're dealing with magic, you can talk about the dark forces or Satan or all this kind of stuff. But really what you're dealing with magic is a force which is unexplainable as opposed to something that is a miracle or something that is spiritual or supernatural is when God directly intervenes. Now, that, of course, relies on God actually being real and God actually being personal as well, which I know that you don't accept, uh, not in its whole anyway, but it actually doesn't matter because the Bible, well, if you look at the Bible, it never actually claims to be anything other than the truth, and it never stops to really uh, discuss that in any other way. It starts off with, in the beginning, God, it presupposes God, and it has every right to do that as what it is, which is the truth of the Bible. How is unexplainable supernatural magic performed by demons different from unexplainable supernatural magic perf or miracle performed by... I didn't demons? say it was unexplainable with miracles. I gave you the explanation, Well, that is the, de the is English God. definition, but... I know it's the English definition, but I'm coming from a okay. Bible perspective. We've already said you're dealing with a supernatural aspect here. That supernatural aspect is God. So it, now, so if it has you an want explanation? To deny the super, if you want to... Uh, yeah, it does have an explanation because in the beginning, God... Now, uh, that they, starts uh, with I, I God. That I know you don't accept that, but at the end of the day, we're debating over a subject which is supernatural in inherency because we're dealing with a global flood, which the yeah. Bible is explicitly clear started from God. So you are going to have to, if you want to debate over a flood, you're going to have to start off by saying, well, there has to be a cause for the flood, and the Bible is clear that that causes God. Yeah, that's why it's not scientific. Um, so how mm -hmm. did... Uh, can you explain how freshwater or uh, animals survived in the flood? Um, sure. Ones that are known to not be able to survive in. Sure, well, absolutely. Um, I've worked uh, briefly with aquariums before, and what's fascinated me the first time I started work there is you can keep saltwater fish and freshwater fish in the same tanks. The way you do it is you them? start them off separately. All species? The, vast, the vast majority of them, but I'll come on to that in a second. What you actually do is you acclimatize them to different forms of salty water and freshwater, and you can actually end up mixing them together. And a, a really clear example of this is salmon, which can easily go from both. Now, just because we have fish today that can't survive in that, and there are many fish today that can't survive uh, in either fresh or salty water, they have to have one or the other, that's not evolution, that's devolution. 
Because what you've gone is you've gone from a status where they can actually survive in both to a status where they can now actually survive in only one or the other. And that's no help to them in the slightest. Before they were better off, now they're not. They've actually lost the information. They've lost the ability to do something. That's devolution. That's going downhill. That's no help to the theory of evolution, the spiral climbing upwards in the slightest. How much time do we have left? Yeah, I was just going to jump in. So we've got 22 seconds left. So, Stake, if you want to ask one final question, allow uh, uh, Joe to answer it, and then we'll Yeah, switch. I just I wanted you to address the uh, multiple heat problems that mm -hmm. are inherent in this whole uh, mess of miracles and uh, mix of mir miracles in nature. Okay, I don't know how I'm going to do that in three seconds, but um, <laughs> there's uh, uh, it's a huge topic and we can talk about lots of stuff. I've briefly mentioned one point very, very quickly, if I'm allowed to. Um, one of the research things that I've been interested in is the formation of coal and the formation of uh, coalification and carbonization in fossils, which we see in huge volumes all over the earth. We've been able to produce coal in the space of 24 hours. And one thing that we've actually found is that heat is needed in order to produce a huge volume of coal. Um, and also it is a great absorber of heat as well. You just add heat to the mix and it absorbs it up instantly and it doesn't go out, even when you're dealing with a tank full of water in which you're actually producing this carbonization. Now, that's not to say that that's the ultimate answer because you can go into radio halos and loads and loads of different stuff, which we don't have time for now. I suspect it's a multitude of different answers, uh, but I think that the formation of coal and the absorption of heat had a big thing to do with the heat problem in the flood. Okay, well, that uh, <laughs> includes the first round of cross-examination. That was a quick eight minutes. Good job to the both of you. And we're going to hand it over to Joe. You now have eight minutes to cross-examine Taylor whenever you good. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm going to start with a question. I'll just put the question up on the screen if I can, uh, if I can just quickly, very quickly pull it up. <clears throat> Here it is. Okay, this is a question which I'd like you to uh, to give me your opinion on. Can you provide any example of evidence for evolution that does not presuppose evolution has already happened? Because otherwise we must all conclude that this is a world where creatures are observed to only reproduce after their own kind, as Genesis states that they were created to do. Yeah, the I'm entire... just going to pause the timer there. I'm just going to pause the mm -hmm. timer because, uh, Joe, were you saying you wanted to put it on screen? Uh, did it not go on screen? I don't see it yet. Okay, one second. Hold on. Let me just try this again. Uh, here we go. Try it this way. I think I may have just uh, not shared it properly. Uh, yeah, there it is. How's that? Can you see yeah. that now? Lovely job. Uh, there's the question. Yeah, we got it now. You're good. Excellent. So, there's the question. Can okay, you provide perfect. any examples I'll, I'll of evidence for evolution? Go. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so like I said, the fossil record is literally just a record of what happened, so we can see sequentially what happened and life-changing. We don't have to presuppose anything. We can literally just observe it. Um, and there's also the hypothesis of evolution. You don't presuppose a hypothesis when you go to test it. It's just a hypothesis. So we had the hypothesis, and we tested it. It made valuable predictions, and then it became scientific. Well, I'm stop sharing for a second. Um, if you have uh, actually look at what Charles Darwin did, it's very interesting because he already stated and openly stated that he believed in the form of natural selection before he went even on his famous uh, Beagle trip. He took a copy of Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, presupposing the Earth to be millions of years old, he specifically went looking. I mean, if you read his letters of the voyage of the Beagle, he clearly states this. If you go back into the history, you're already presupposing it. Now, your fossil record, when you go to look at the fossil record, um, you already have accepted that evolution is true. And so everything you look at, you actually try and fit in. What I'm asking is, can you give me an example, and just one example, not just generally saying the fossil record, can you give me one example of evolution which does not already presuppose that evolution has actually happened? One example of observing it? Yes. So um, to address the presupposition of an old earth, you don't have to presuppose anything about time to observe the change in the ecologies in the rocks. Um, you just have to understand that it's sequential and that's it. And 
if you want That's a specific, right. can you give me an example of it? A specific uh, line of evolution, like the Archaeopteryx specific, or the whale evolution. Specific evidence of change, observable change, which uh, does not presuppose evolution. We can see that in modern species. The uh, the pig, for example, has gained new ribs, new spinal columns. Mm -hmm. uh, the fish species I mentioned earlier, I can get the actual name of those real quick if you want, but uh, we've observed th within the same species, individuals of them have completely different fin designs. And is that from a gain of information or is that from a loss of genetic information? Depends on how you define information. It's just a change of information. There's not if you're okay. saying gain, uh, a gain in the actual total number of nucleotides. I'm not sure about that. Um, if it's, but again, it, is it a gain of information? If you, have you ever seen those Lego sets where you can make a car or a robot from the same pieces? Mm -hmm. That's a, is it a gain of information or is it just a change of information? That's that's really ambiguous. We would have to talk about how you define information. Well, what's interesting in that scenario that you've just used is that you have an intelligent mind behind it deciding where to go and how to actually redesign it. You see, I've got nothing wrong with using the same nucleotides or the same uh, physical uh, you know, bits and pieces, if you like, of an organism being used for different things in different organisms, because I believe in a common designer, just like your analogy with the Lego uses a common designer, i.e. your brain, to turn one thing into a robot and use exactly the same bricks to turn it into the house. What I'm talking about is can we actually observe anything today where you have got an original source of genetic information, which has added a new trait or a new feature to an animal observable piece, which actually adds new information and doesn't just simply rearrange the information that it's already got because the big point is um you and i when you're getting down into the dna we are designed to not evolve we have mutation checkers mutation is not a natural thing we are specifically designed to not mutate and so when you're actually dealing with mutations and dealing with new traits as a result of that every single example we've got is a from a loss of information not a gain in the slightest uh, was there a question there? Yeah, so can you give me an example of a yeah, game I've, of I've already given you several examples, but we, uh, we still haven't defined... Of a fish, which is... Still still, defined... the fish, was that the stickleback fish you were talking about? Was that the, uh, the one from Lake Constance? I'm not sure what the... Okay. I'm, tr I'm trying to find it right That's now, fine. but... Uh... Uh, we still haven't defined what information is, and what you were saying an intelligent designer versus a natural evolution is completely ir irrelevant to how much information is actually present. Cause it, uh -huh. you could measure the amount of information, whether it was designed or it wasn't designed. Yes, so you can measure exactly sure the same amount of information. You can measure the exactly the same amount of information, but it's how you actually program that information. I mean, when we're dealing with a design, right, or what is a design and what isn't a design, and how would we recognize design if it came up and hit you in the face? The very definition of design is if something has properties which do not come from the materials that it's made of, it has an extra thing which can only come from intelligence. So when you're dealing with, for instance, a computer code like I've got in front of me, it's ones and noughts. They have no inherent information in them in the slightest. Get an intelligent design, right. an intelligent mind to put them into the right string, you end up with a computer code which can code for a Microsoft program and then you go and become a billionaire. When you're dealing with DNA, you're dealing with sugars, phosphates, uh, carbons and hydrogens, or nitrogen, sorry. Um, each one of those you probably ate for your breakfast this morning, not one of those has any inherent information, but put together in the right order, you get a beautifully complex way which actually codes for your life and checks itself. So when we're talking with information, we're talking about something that inherently codes for something else right now the example so, that you used go ahead sorry yeah so the fish was the red tail catfish um, oh, red tail catfish okay and um yeah it's interesting that you bring up the computer code thing because the most advanced code the most advanced information we have in computers was actually evolved naturally without any design um and simply selected for so Again, it, what do you mean by information? Is that actually just the amount of bits or nucleotides, or me, is it just, the complexity of the the phenotype? Um, let me just throw it back I'm at not you, sure what you very mean. quickly, so because I'm, I'm pulling stuff together here. Um, what would you define as inf information? Then that might help. What would what, what would you define as information? 
Um, I would say that it's just the amount of bits that are in that's at least that's the only measurable way the amount of um, bits that are in the instruction whether that okay, be nucleotide how, so, or so you whatever. would you would define information by a number as opposed to content and um, I, I guess I would say a non redundant but in that case some of the some redundant information is actually needed to make something function properly so the uh, yeah, that's the only measurable way that I know how to talk about it. Okay, it looks so like we've got time for one more question, Joe. Okay, one more question, fine. Um, given examples, fossil examples, such as bacteria life forms and stromatolites that have remained unchanged uh, from when they first appear in the fossil record to the present day, whether you want to argue that they'd be 3 billion years old or not, why would you believe in evolution when it simply hasn't happened according to the fossils? Uh given that they haven't changed because they i showed you the record of coelacanths that um, i was i didn't even know there was well i thought you asked for just an example no i said but, give an uh, example such as bacterial life forms and stromatolites oh um from well since the macro uh multicellular animals do in fact change over time um the bacterial fossils i th they're very small it's pretty hard to uh we can't see their genomes. No, we can see, we see many. Cell. We can't we see can many see the complete scale. We can see their complete cell structure. I've got a picture up here somewhere, but I don't think I've got time to pull okay. it up now. Um, well, how much time? much longer have we got? Standing for truth. Well, we've got about five seconds, so it might be a good uh, time to chance, no, no, no. We'll call that then. round. Okay, well, let's wrap it up. That was uh, a lot of fun. Time flew by. I got to say, great job to the both of you. Uh, great job to the chat. Once again, thanks for all the awesome questions coming in. So we're going to have an awesome uh, audience Q&A. So why don't we uh, hand it over to Taylor because you have a five-minute concluding statement whenever you are ready. All right. Uh, one second. Yeah, so I wasn't... I didn't know this would be so much about evolution, but I guess that should have been expected. Um, uh, I guess I'll tackle evolution first. So every single minor change that would be required for a macro evolution to actually occur, um, which is just adding up of small changes, that has been observed in reality. We've seen uh, extremely complex information being added to like the brassica as i showed you um small flowers that are just occur in bunches have been transformed into mathematically fractalized uh broccolis um that's a huge change in body plan and require and obviously it has fractal mathematics in it so it's not losing information um and um so every single change that occurs th that we would see between the strata is explainable by the change that we see in animals today, which is the change of shape, size, uh, proportion, number, um, orientation, and location of bones that are actually in the body plan. So there are fish out there with uh, fins that they use like legs on the sea floor but they still look more like fins and then there are fish that you that have jointed fins that look more like frogs and then there are fish that can crawl up onto the land using their fins and hang out on land and then there are fish that have transformed their float bladders into lungs and they ne they never have both which is strong indication that uh, float bladders evolved into lungs because the only real difference between them is like the density of the blood vessels for capturing oxygen and the thickness of the skin there um so we already see that it's possible for a fish to crawl up onto land and become more of an amphibian type uh every single modification that would be required is actually observable we we see ch vast changes in the same species of fins so we can see how they would get more lizard-like feet. Um, and as soon as they are up on land living as amphibians, we, we know they can survive on oxygen. Uh, they've raised fish on land for uh, 
like up to a year, I think. Um, and um, they have different, they have different um, bodies, their musculature changes so they can adapt to these environments. Um, and fish already have scales. So all that re is required is uh, basically um, uh, scale retention and you have uh, a, a reptile type um, animal and we know that scales can be converted to feathers and hairs and they're the the same material this come from the same pores the same um when they're um developing uh i'll briefly mention that whales grow full limbs in utero and then lose them that's a strong indication that they were four-legged animals um there's no reason god would program them to have more information, to grow limbs, just to lose them. This is only explainable by evolutionary change. Um, so yeah, uh, there. the only thing that would prevent any of this from happening is not having enough time, because we know that these changes do happen relatively slowly. Um, we haven't really seen any reason to question the radiometric dating. And if they are questionable, we have massive heat problems, which... Uh, along with the radiation, the uh, heat produced by radiation and the heat produced by tectonic plates, I, uh, which is over 22 times more energy than would require for the, for the oceans to boil over, even if the oceans were three times larger than they are today. One minute. That That's a massive problem. I don't see any math uh published by anyone to suggest that hurricanes can or uh heat going into coal can change that the heat would still be around um it would have to be a lot of coal but we know that coal is produced by organic material being compressed so that's uh, I, there's no uh, there's just problems at every angle um and yeah, I suppose that that'll wrap it up just about. Okay, awesome. With 10 seconds to spare, so thank you to the both of you for keeping this on time. Uh, thank you for the concluding statement, Taylor. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Joe. Joe, you have five minutes whenever you're ready. If you need me to share screen or anything like that, of course, let me know. I can pause the timer. Uh, but the, uh, the floor is yours. You are muted, Joe. Just make sure you unmute yourself. And whenever you're ready. So I'm trying to share screen at the same time. I can't <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> no, bear with me. no problem. No problem. All right, here we go. You can see that. There can we go. I'm that? putting it on yep, screen right good. now, and Definitely. you are good. You're good. Wonderful. Okay, well, what I'm going to do to conclude here is really get down to the crux of the issue. Um, Taylor sort of started on some, some sort of moral and stuff, so I'm going to finish on that. What's the real debate here? What's really going on behind the scenes? Let's for a reminder with what is science, according to the National Academy of Science in the USA. In science, everything we observe, measure, and discover must be successfully tested again and again before it is accepted as valid and factual evidence of what is real. So not only must you be observable, measurable, and discoverable, it must actually be able to be repeatedly and successfully tested over and over again. Do the book test. You see, what you get with the main uh, body, or the at least the origin of the theory of evolution, which, by the way, there are many, many different uh, types of, and I was going to, uh, if we had time to get to uh, uh, question Taylor on this as to which version of evolution he actually believed in. Um, but what you actually get is you get a second-hand uh, pass on of information from Darwin about the origin of species. He went, he observed something or claimed to observe something, he wrote a book about it and presented it to us. We test his ideas and it's called Biology 101. Um, let's do it with the Bible. You get a second-hand information from Genesis on origins, as in Moses detailed from God passed down onto us. But if we try and test those ideas, if we try and test the ideas based on Genesis, um, we don't call it science at all. In fact, we get cri criticized and uh, rebuked for it. If one is called science, then really, what is the other? 
You see, we're now delving into moral issues and spiritual issues here. Dr. David Green from Tasmania uh, University says science recognises no authority. He says that there is no historical authority, neither is there any human authority. Again, science teacher, very prestigious uh, scientific journal for teachers or, or teacher's journal, stated this a few years back, scientific theories are therefore explanations about aspects of nature without reference to God. I wonder where that idea came from, because it's certainly not inherent in the science world. You see, the real battle is that any answer is actually acceptable to science, provided it is or has to be agnostic or atheistic. You really want to win this debate? You need to actually recognize what the real issue is here and change the ballpark from science versus religion to atheism versus theism, which is really truth versus error. Because evolution and deep time, if you trace it back through history, and it's a fascinating study if you do, it all started with the rejection of the biblical account. It all started as a willful want, a willful desire to want to get rid of there being any need for a God and an excuse for atheism, which is really what evolution is. Here's your evolutionary uh, history of life from your primeval soup up through the struggle of life, survival of the fittest, which means extinction of the unfit, death and disease up to the point we are today with people and parasites. And Avon Attenborough says, why on earth would a good God create us like this? Interesting, if he, because of course he believes in this version. Um, evolutionary solution to death. You see, this is where the evolutionists hope that science will progress us to. Um, Dr. Carl from Sydney University says by 2002, we'd worked out most of human DNA. Over the next 50 years, he believes this knowledge will lead to a huge revolution in medicine, which will end up having a generation which can actually live forever or at least 500 to 5,000 years in a healthy 18 to 25 year old body. This is where evolution is, or scientists at least, uh, and philosophers are hoping that evolution is going to take us into a medical revolution where we can actually live forever. It's an evolutionary solution to death. Of course, get the Genesis big picture. You, according to the Bible, you don't die because you get old, because according to the Bible, death is not a biological necessity. This is the real incompatibility between uh, Christianity and evolution. And Taylor mentioned earlier that there wasn't any. Well, I'm sorry, but according to the Bible, death, which is a major part of the evolution One story, minute. is a moral penalty, not a biological necess necessity at all. And there's actually no way out unless that penalty is paid. You see, the ultimate thing is that only the creator Christ cared enough to actually become your saviour. This debate is all about Jesus Christ. I'd encourage Taylor and our audience to read John's gospel, particularly John chapter one, where it says, in the beginning was the word, the word who was God created all things. The word who was God who created all things came down to the planet. And in verse 14 of John chapter one, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Follow the logic through. The creator who created us, mankind who sinned and destroyed us. Um, so don't you dare blame God for the mess that we're in today. It's not his fault in the slightest. It's our fault. And he actually provided a way out. And that was Jesus Christ. I'll finish it there. But a reminder to go to creationresearch.net. Click on the Q&A if you don't get your question answered this evening. Well, thank you. Concluding statement, Joe, uh, thank you to both debaters for giving us their time for tonight's debate. I got to say, this was a ton of fun. It's been over an hour and a half, and I got to say, uh, an hour and a half has flown by. Uh, the chat has been awesome, very lively, lots of questions, super chats, and super stickers. Therefore, what I am going to do is uh, put a timer for 20 minutes, and therefore, we will get to as many questions as we can. I will, uh, I'll start with the super chats, and yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Standing for truth. Can I please be uh, humbly excused for one minute while I run to use the restroom? Of course. Of course. Yeah. And, <laughs> I'll and, see you back in just <laughs> one second. Hey, completely understandable, guys. We're going to do an intermission. And uh, all the everybody in the chat, guys, Taylor, if you'd like to take a, a one minute intermission as well, it's up to you. And we'll come back with questions. This is your final chance, guys, in the audience to ask some last minute questions pertaining to the topic. And in the meantime, we'll go on a couple minute intermission.
I'm back, folks. Okay. <laughs> My uh, wonderful wife has been providing me with drinks all throughout the evening, and what goes in has to come out eventually. So, uh, <laughs> my apologies. I feel your pain. Don't worry. I've been drinking coffee and water the entire time. So, uh, it is that quite being said, every day it's uh, 20 minutes to midnight. So, uh, you need the coffee to keep you going. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and um, I hope everybody enjoyed the commercial break. So why don't we get right into it? I am going to go all the way back to the beginning of these questions. Now, what we like to do on this channel to keep it most uh, as fair as possible, uh, whoever the question is for, we're going to make sure they get the last word. But let's say there's a question for Taylor. He can answer the question. Joe can have a response, give his thoughts on that question, and then we'll hand it back to Taylor for last words. And same goes if the question's for Joe. And, and we I have 20 minutes for question time, through. yeah? That's right. That's right. So I'm going to start the, the timer right now. We've got 20 minutes. And mm -hmm. let me pick out the first one out of this massive bunch of questions we have here. And I've seen the see. chat just exploding. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So here's a question right. from... George Bond, this is the Super Chats. So I'm going to start with the Super Chats, guys. Uh, thanks so much, George, for the uh, for the Super Chat and for the support. So question is for Snake. Snake was right. Why do we find mega sequences and monolithic layers across all the continents? Um, I'm not a geologist, but uh, it's because there was deposition at the same time all around the world. That's my understanding of it. Okay, thank you for the question. Thanks for the response, Snake. Uh, we can hand it over to Joe if you had a, a response as well. Go ahead. Sure. Um, well, I've had the privilege over um, a few years now to get to travel to many places around the world and actually study these things in themselves. And one thing you start to recognize is that you can actually match up a vast majority of the mega sequences over not just uh, entire countries, but entire continents and many times multi-continents. Now, uh, Taylor is absolutely right. The evidence shows that there was a massive area of flooding of some description or large water-based uh, uh, deposition there but you really do have to pay attention to how large these sequences are because they are just phenomenal. I mean, I mentioned one this evening with the Carboniferous. Uh, another one would I mentioned was the Chattanooga Shale, which covers the vast majority of the North American continent. And they are all pointing, all the fossils are pointing in the same way. I mean, wonderful, great big branches and tree branches all pointing in the same way. And I can take you down to um, Australia around Gympie and you can see, again, a massive log jam, which covers the vast majority of Australia. You can come and have a look at my main thesis work uh, was at Hunstanton, which is a small little beach, basically, but it's mostly dealing with chalk. And you're dealing with fossils, belemnites, sort of pointy bullet shaped things, all pointing in the same direction, all in the same direction across every single Cretaceous deposit that I've ever studied. And by the way, you can get in a plane and follow the Cretaceous deposits all the way across Europe, through Asia, and on the west coast of Australia. Now that is a very, very big flood. Um, so, yeah, I would actually, in a sense, well, strangely enough, I, I agree with, uh, <laughs> with with Taylor at this point. Um, it was a event, but what you're not dealing with is a local flood. What you're dealing with is a very, very large flood indeed. Now, by very definition of a flood, um, well, if your tap bursts and water pours all over your floor, you've got a flood because a flood by definition is water where water shouldn't be. So what do we do when we look inside these mega sequences? We find land plants and land animals buried, squashed, rapidly deposited next to far deep sea creatures. That is a flood water where water shouldn't be animals, uh, land animals and plants and sea animals and plants being washed together into one sequence. Well, thank you for that response, uh, Joe. And of course, Taylor, the question was originally for you. So we're going to hand it over to you for the last words, if you'd like them. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not uh, usually seen right next to each other, but uh, the fact that there are uh, things happening at the same geological timescale is not really an indication of a, a single flood. Um, 
but it could be a gradual process at the same time, but also the fact that so many marine animals died and actually it seems greater numbers in total than land animals in a flood it just seems to baffle the mind. So I, I still don't think I brought that point up earlier, but that's that's another major reason I can't get on board with the flood story. Okay, well, this is um, kind of a follow-up question. We got a bunch of questions pertaining to the flood and um, the geologic column and, and sediment. So I'm going to combine these two questions into one, uh, which can kind of expand on what we've just discussed here. So the, a super chat came in from Raymond. I appreciate the super chat. And the question is, are sediments from time or a process... But Joe Wilson also asks, and, and the, the questions are for you, Snake, uh, where did the successive layers in the geologic column come from? But they can kind of apply to both models uh, since they directly uh, stated the question was for you, Snake. Why don't we start with you? Then we'll hand it back to uh, Joe. Uh, so is the question just how, how stratiform at all? Um... It, well, it, yeah, it is sediments from time or a process combined? Where did the successive layers come from? Uh, there's um, there's layers that are coming up towards the surface. There's uh, there's um, obviously floods that can wash it down from the mountains, which get pushed up from the tectonic plates. Uh, there's wind. Uh, I have some boxes in my backyard that already have a layer of sediment on them just by sitting there for a month or two. Um, they come from a lot of different places. Volcanoes produces new rock on the surface. The rock breaks down. The rock gets transported. That's why it takes a long time for them to form. Okay, I appreciate that response, and I appreciate the questions from Joe and Raymond. Uh, we'll hand it over to Joe. Floor is yours for for response. If you need me to repeat the questions or anything, let me know. No, that's fine. Um, as I say we could spend hours and hours on just this question alone, but let me briefly comment a few things. Um, first of all, every example which Taylor just mentioned about where sediment came from are all observable today. So he's fallen into the same trap that Charles Lyell made, which is all sedimentary processes have to be explained by events that are observable today. Now, if you do that, that works well and great until you actually try and match it up with the known geological record, when you actually find that there's no way that the events are visible today could possibly produce the same things because we're looking at limestone formation we're looking at tectonic activity we're looking at volcanic activity and they are not producing stuff that we see in the past i mean if you want to talk volcanic volcanism I personally have studied the North Atlantic Igneous Province, which, by the way, goes from the sort of uh, Northern Ireland up to Scotland, over to Iceland. And yes, I've been to Iceland. I've been to see it. I've been to match it up. It's an incredible space made up of millions of square uh, cubed kilometers. It's an enormous basalt sequence. It's known as a flood basalt sequence. And we are just not observing anything of that scale today. And the biggest estimates or the latest estimates that would be that if you wanted to produce such a thing like that, you would need to have a massive technology tonic activity ripping the world in half. Sounds a lot like what the Bible describes as a worldwide flood and the uh, fountains of the great deep bursting forth. If you want to go to other sediments as well, and I've got a whole presentation here, I was going to pull some slides up, but I just don't think we've got time for that. Um, the comment which uh, Taylor made earlier, which was about maybe occasionally you find some of these things mixed together. Again, I've had the privilege of actually traveling the world and digging these things up. I can promise you they're absolutely not a rare occurrence. You find any incredible amount of mixed environments. My academic background, by the way, predominantly is paleobiology. Um, we try and recreate ecosystems in the rocks. And I was taught, you go to the rocks, you study them, you look at them, you create an ecosystem out of them. And a time and time again, you do that and you simply cannot create an ecosystem out of them because they are a flood dump. So when you're actually dealing with these sequences which cover most of the of the world, uh, you have to say, hey, this is a process because uh, they're full of fossils. You cannot create a fossil slowly because it will just simply destroy your creature before you have time to fossilize it. It needs to be quick. So the fact that you're dealing with a process there should tell you one thing. Um, secondly, when we're talking about how sedimentation actually forms, the standard idea proposed first by Nicholas Stino in the late 
to middle to late 1600s is you have suspended settle, uh, sediment, which settles down and slowly builds up. Of course, you have to ask the question, where did sediment actually come from in the first place, which is part of the question we've uh, just heard. But also you've got to ask the question of, what do we observe today when it comes to sediments being formed by water? Because the vast majority of deposits that we see, rock deposits, especially these mega sequences around the world, are all flood deposits, meaning they were laid down in water, not sand slowly blowing into place, not volcanoes slowly forming ash and so on and so forth. They're water to based. OK, when you actually go and study water and you study the way that water flows, you study the way that water transports, you study the way that water actually deposits, you find that they're not actually forming bottom to top, they're forming sideways. As the water is flowing, it's actually carrying the sediment with it and depositing it as it goes. Now, it's long been recognized that the Grand Canyon grows old sideways, and it's long been ignored because you just simply can't explain that using long ages. Um, when you're actually dealing with the real world and you match it up to the rock records, what you find is that water always behaves the same way, no matter how much of it you have. And you can do experiments in flume tanks where you're pumping water in sediment, and they produce exactly the same thing that we're seeing on a large scale it's just on a much smaller scale so yeah you're dealing with a process absolutely no doubt about it okay get a response thank right? you for that response joe and um yeah thanks for keeping this so engaging guys yes uh technically snake the uh question was directed at you your name was tagged in it so we'll consider it your yeah. question therefore to be fair you get the last word i'll keep it short uh so i guess that was a lot but um so uh, going back to the original question, the vast majority of experts seem to think it's explainable. And again, I'm not a geologist, but I'm here to talk about how, how we can go through things um, epistemologically. How, how can we know that things are true? And we, we can't know everything. So sometimes we have to go with the experts. My understanding of geology is not expert, but... Uh, I have a basic understanding. So, um, and, and we can appeal to the people who know what they're talking about. So you're trying to say that they're wrong. Um, and um, uh, considering the, uh, the co comment about how we're only using things that we can actually observe to that, to explain things that happened in the past. And yeah, that's, I think that's the scientific way to do things. Um, what we actually observe is the best basis for science and not have conjecture that just tries to make things fit with ancient myths. And um, the final thing is um, I'm not denying that floods do did occur in the geologic uh, record um, that land animals can die in water, that water environments can dry up on land. I'm just uh, trying to demonstrate how it's, it's not only explainable by a single flood because that's also precluded by the fact of rock deposition rates and uh, the heat problem primarily are my concerns. Okay, well, thank you for that response. Thanks for the response from the both of you. So we're going to move on to the next question here from Crimson Air. Uh, There's a couple questions that came in that were pretty well the same. So uh, it goes back to the portion where you guys were talking about evolution. And Crimson Air asks, uh, for you, Taylor, he says, since evolution occurs by random mutation, how can an organism possibly exist for 50 plus millions, year, millions of years without accumulating macroevolutionary changes like the coelacanth? Well, not all individuals have the same changes, so it's kind of like asking why there are still uh, cats if there are different types of cats. Well, some of them are going to accumulate changes, some of them are not going to accumulate changes, and some of them are going to uh, purge those changes. It's pretty, seems pretty easily explained to me. Like, is this basically why are there still monkeys type of question? <laughs> Okay, well, I appreciate the response. I appreciate the question, Crimson Air. We're going to hand it over to Joe. Joe, go ahead for a response. Can you just repeat that question for me again? Yes, definitely. Uh, here it is right here. Since evolution occurs by random mutations, how can any organism possibly exist for 50 plus millions of years without accumulating macroevolutionary changes? And he points to the coelacanth as an example. Mm-hmm. 
Um, well, that sort of goes back a bit to. I'm not quite sure if the question is posed in the in the in the greatest way because um, I'm still not entirely sure I understand the, the specific point that he's getting at. So, uh, but it goes back to if you're talking about living fossils and the like, um, it goes back to the point that I was making earlier. And yes, we know we've uh, discussed with Taylor with uh, uh, the coelacanth and the changes and stuff. But I still maintain the original point that I made is that they are all still within their same created kind. What we haven't seen, yes, we've seen changes within the coelacanth. Yes, we know that there's differences between some of the fossil coelacanths and some of the modern coelacanths. And by the way, we have fossil coelacanths in our collection. So we do know what we're talking about when it comes to the physical fossils. And just like I used the example earlier of the ginkgo leaf, in the past, Jurassic, they had great big fronds on them, uh, four, five, six sometimes. Today, they very rarely do. Oh, occasionally you get one or two. So we know that the genetics is still there. We know that the code to actually have fronds is still there, whether it's suppressed or whether it's majority lost. But the reality is they are exactly the same kind. There's no doubt about that. And there's no doubt about that in even secular evolutionary mind either. But there is definitely a change that's gone on. Um, the difference is the change, well, two things really. First of all, the change has always come from a loss of information. So you end up with your original code of information. Now, when you're dealing with mutations, you can really have one of three things. You can delete a letter, you can add an extra letter, or you can swap a letter around when it comes to DNA. Now, the vast majority of those mutations mean nothing. A very small of those mutations, or the, sort of the vast majority of them actually get corrected because we have an inbuilt mechanism for actually correcting our DNA. Uh, the rest of them mostly don't mean anything. A small amount can actually cause change. And the vast majority of that small amount mean that the animal is now at a disadvantage. But a very, very tiny amount means that, well, there's a change, but they don't actually um, really get affected in the slightest. What we've never seen is anywhere near enough information, new information be added in order to say, okay, we're going to try and turn this dinosaur into a bird. It simply doesn't exist. It's not observable. You can't see it in the fossil record. Um, it just simply doesn't exist in the slightest. Okay. Um, Thank you for that response, Joe. And uh, yes, Taylor, the question was originally for you. So therefore, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Taylor, for some final words. Okay. So I'll just point out that uh, there are no organisms that haven't gone through changes. Um, I showed the, the pictures of the coelacanth um, fossils that were found through time, and they were actually very different, but uh, they have different bones and shapes and proportions. But uh, creationists do recognize that uh, comparative anatomy there is valid because they call them all coelacanths. It's just when they, it's not valid um, just when morphology starts to bleed into other kinds which I also mentioned, uh, barren monology has uh, come up with uh, techniques to tell which kinds are different, but uh, that ended up backfiring because that uh, demonstrated that there are actually larger gaps in morphology within kinds than across kinds, um, specifically with birds and dinosaurs. There were actually bigger morphological gaps in the birds and in the dromaeosaurs than there were gaps between birds and between dromaeosaurs. Um, so that there was actually uh those criteria actually said that by the definition of that dermatology put forth they are the same kind so um i'd also i'll just finally add that there's uh there's very little information required to bring a dinosaur into a bird um just a smaller tail bigger breastbone fused fingers um a loss of teeth uh scales converted into Feathers is about the largest one, except we already know dinosaurs have feathers, so that's not even a requirement to bring dinosaurs to two birds. Um, so yeah, oh, they they also already have um, the same breathing systems and the same bone systems as birds do. Um, so okay, well, thank you again, and thank very you. small. I appreciate the responses from the both of you. I appreciate the questions. This next question, again, is for you, Taylor. So I appreciate you being a good sport. Most of these questions are for you. We've got a lot of creations in the chat. Me. So this question is from... <laughs> so I apologize, Joe. Um, I'm looking through these I'll questions. I feel bad for you, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're in the hot seat, Taylor. <laughs> I think you're used to it, though, Taylor, when you debate here. So uh, you're a good yeah. sport. I appreciate it. The question is from Douglas. 
Douglas Boff, Boffy. So I appreciate the question. He says, for Taylor, when rocks from Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, they were radioisotope dated. It came out as millions of years. How do you, Taylor, account for that? Yeah, as far as I know, there those were only some of the samples, and uh, and also the other samples, the majority of the samples were accurate. Um, but the other thing is there is a an error rate that is recognized. It's sometimes in the millions of years, but that. Uh, in the dates that they're actually dating to in hundreds of millions of years, that error rate is actually negligible. So there's actually several reasons um, that that's explained by mainstream geology. And the other thing is contamination also occurs too. And uh, mainstream scientists know when that occurs. I know that it was the creationist uh, scientists who, who were doing that, I think, uh, for Mount St. Helens that found the the wrong dates and it's been criticized their methods have been criticized up and down um but i'll try and keep it short i guess all right well thanks for the question thanks for the response uh let's hand it over to joe uh go ahead with with your response how, how many minutes have we got <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually we are we're but probably we gonna have to make this the last today. question because yeah uh, i've got just under two minutes on the clock, but uh, okay. take your time. Why don't we, um, cause this will actually put us at the two hour mark. So Joe, why don't you give your response? Mm -hmm. It was Taylor's question. We'll hand it over to him for the last word yeah. and um, we'll call it on the Q and a. So go ahead, Joe. Well, seeing as this, this is this sort of the last word that I'm going to have, I just would like to um, share a uh, slide if I may very briefly sure, yeah. if that works there we go because this is what it really this this whole argument I mean, we could spend hours and hours and hours discussing radiometric dating and so on and so forth what am i looking for slideshow there we go all right i mentioned lyle earlier this goes into slightly deeper um depth with it and it also gives you the full perspective on where this whole idea sort of came from uh i must say that most present day geologists have abandoned uh lyle's sort of anti-catastrophism and like i say many geologists today would recognize catastrophes just as taylor does but on a small scale but and this is the big but uh they all use lyle's assumptions to date the rocks assumptions which go back by the way to the french revolutionary who were looking for a way to destroy the monarchy, which was apparently imposed by God, which goes back to the Hindu and the Greek and the Babylonian philosophies, which were originally, and you can trace it all the way back, there as a rejection of scripture. And this is the assumption which is used, the present is the key to the past. And that is an assumption. That's a philosophy which you have to use in order to interpret the rocks around you. The, the present is the key to the past. It's the principle of uniformitarianism. Now, this is the point. Um, Lyle's aims was to free science from Moses. There's the reference there. Clear as day, and he states it several times throughout his publications and letters. He was on an agenda to actually discredit the Bible, and it had nothing to do with evidence when he was actually putting it together. This is the problem. All modern scientists, such as physics, biology, geology, particularly in geology and particularly in uh, geophysics, when you're dealing with things like radiometric dating and the like, they all use Lyell's assumptions to date the rocks, to date the age of the stars, the distance of the stars, life, etc., and so on forth. Um, the reality is any dating method carbon-14, starlight, same speed, radioactive dates, or any geological history based on Lyell's uniformitarianism assumption will always contradict the biblical account of six-day creation and the flood. And the reason is very simple, because the Bible says that the past is not the key to the present, it's the other way around. That the past, uh, sorry, not the, the present is the key to the past, it's the other way around. The Bible states that the past is the key to the present. Uh, Noah's flood, creation, the fall of mankind, the reason why we're in sin today, the reason why we need Jesus Christ today, has got everything to do with what happened in the past and not the other way around. Now, both of these are philosophies. Both of these are philosophies which we use to actually interpret the world around us, and uh, both of them are based upon faith. A faith which is based, one, in the idea that the present is the key to the past, the other one is based in the other way around, that the Bible is true. Therefore, and this is the concluding point, it is not the evidence that disagrees with the biblical record of creation and Noah's flood over the last six to 7,000 years, it's the opinions of men who willfully set out to reject and replace the word of God. Um, that's the real issue that we're dealing with here. 
Thank you, Joe, for the response and for the visuals. I appreciate it. Um, as with all the questions, Taylor, the question was directed at you. So we'll hand it back to you for some final words there. Yeah, I guess I'll just kind of uh, do a second uh, final wrap up, uh, I guess. Um, so I guess he's making a an accusation that it was all a con that modern science is all a conspiracy to get rid of god um even though a lot of scientists believe in god it's kind of bizarre um so um and a lot of them were a lot of this work was actually done by clergy so perhaps it was done to um done perhaps these people were actually against some sect of christianity the ruling sect the monarchy um but science is rarely done because of an actual agenda unless of course obviously creationism states its agenda um but uh yeah the charges of conspiracy are a little bizarre that uh, i don't see that as being backed up um and then um i guess uh just to kind of uh since that was kind of um, just an extension of the bait, I guess we'll I'll end up with the statement because um, I heard a lot of statements in the chat and from uh, Joe tonight that I should read the Bible and things like that. I and that I have an atheist background. I I don't have an atheist background, and I've went to school a Christian school. I read the Bible. I read the whole thing. I was tested on it, and. Um, that's why I'm an atheist. Um, so, yeah, I guess that would be my final word. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Taylor, for those final words. Thanks to the both of you. This has been an awesome debate. Definitely one to remember. Uh, certainly rewatchable, guys, in the chat. Please share this around uh, so we can get as many people as possible to watch this debate. It's very important uh, to discuss these issues. And I want to thank, again, uh, the debaters for for giving us their time because you guys weren't so generous with your with your time like you were we wouldn't have this awesome debate tonight so i want to give you guys the floor for just some final words in terms of closing it down if you wanted to uh kind of plug your ministries or your channels um then then definitely go ahead so whoever would like to start uh maybe taylor since you started with the opening uh we can hand it to you and then we'll give joe some final words there go ahead taylor Oh, well, I guess I should have saved my uh, my last statement for this. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm i trying to be skeptical about things. Uh, I'm trying to use the best epistemology that I have um, by not invoking miracles, not invoking conspiracies to explain things. Um, but if, I, if I'm not an expert in something, I go with the experts. But, of course, you always have to be critical of the experts. So give, give a fair answer. Uh, look into what's go actually going on because uh, they could be wrong. It's happened before. Um, my expertise is in uh, cellular biology, um, and uh, but I'm also really interested in the philosophical, moral aspects. Uh, perhaps Joe might want to talk about the moral aspects one time. Um, I know I barely dipped my toes into that. Uh, he seemed a little bit interested. Um, I'm definitely interested in that. And um, yeah, um, and I am an atheist. And by that, I simply mean that I don't see any valid arguments coming from the theist side. Um, and that's about as far as I'm interested in it. And and I, I have read the Bible, and that's why I'm an atheist. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you for those final words, Taylor. Thanks again for doing this. I appreciate it. And Joe, I'll hand it over to you for some final words as well. Uh, thanks for doing this debate, Joe. Oh, uh, Joe, I think you are uh, muted. There we go. I was going to awesome. say, uh, at this point in the debate, it would be normally where the audience applauses and we walk over and shake each other's hands. So I was going to say I'd love to do that. But then I remembered <laughs> if we were in person, we wouldn't be allowed to do that because of COVID. So uh, a virtual sh shake of the hand to you. And thank you very, very much, Taylor, for, for doing this. I've certainly enjoyed it and uh, preparing it and going through it. I think it's good to uh, it's good to clash like that from time to time. Um, a reminder for for people who are, who are watching, who want to maybe find out more about the work that I do in the ministry. Um, 
Um, plus, I know we had, a, what, 20 minutes of question and answer time hardly seems to do justice to this topic. So uh, if you do want... Um, uh, my uh, uh, sort of opinion, or you want, what we might call the biblical opinion, go to creationresearch.net. You've got two main things on there. The first one is the fact file, which is 20 plus years worth of collected information uh, since creation research has been going. Uh, plus, you've also got the Q&A site, which was launched a few years back now, um, but it contains uh, various people, experts in their own field, from geologists to medical biologists and beyond, who have answered questions that have written in. If you don't see your question in there, please do write it in, because we're always looking for new questions to deal with. Uh, and uh, also, go and check out... Um, I spent a bit of time on um, uh, Taylor's YouTube uh, channel and looking at some of the debates and stuff, and there's some good stuff on there, there's some good clashes on there, there's some good points to think through. So, um, yeah, we're certainly open to all of that as well. So thank you very much, Taylor. It's been great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure for hosting this. This was a lot of fun. Uh, you guys were both cordial and respectful, so it was a very easy debate to moderate. Uh, any links or anything you, you gentlemen want me to put into the description box, I can put links to your channels, your minute, anything like that. Let me know, and I can do so after, after the debate. So that being said, thank you to the chat. Thanks for all the support, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. And we're going to call it a night here. Standing for Truth is out.